Hi, this is Paul, and the guy I'm talking with this evening, at least for him, is no stranger to most of you. This is Justin Brierly, and I had originally thought about doing sort of a uh, one of my typical randos conversation of going through his story, but actually his story over the last, oh, I don't know, number of months has gotten very, very interesting, so I think we'll probably uh, stick to that. So thank you so much, Justin, for giving me this time. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me on, Paul. Well, of course, you are a very familiar face to a lot of the people that I talk to and have been working with for the last number of years, given all of the years on Unbelievable. I, I think that Unbelievable is the very first podcast I ever, that was way back in the day, I would download it and I would load it onto my Zoom or mm. or some computer or something, and I'd listen to it that way. And I thought it was amazing that I'm getting this UK radio program and the program was something that I had never imagined and it went better than I could have imagined. So it it, wow. it really I, I was a I'm, I was a I'm, huge fan. I, I'm honored. I'm honored because you were definitely an early early adopter by the sounds of it, Paul. And I yeah, I can remember sort of going back to when the show was just a radio show. And us saying, well, we, we could try this podcasting thing. And back then, this was the very early days of podcasting. I think 2007, we launched the podcast. So we were kind of one of the early, early shows. And um, and obviously, everyone's got a podcast now. But but back then, you didn't have quite the the choice you have today. So um, I'm so glad that you found, found your way to my one. Yes. Talk to me a little bit about the genesis of that. And, and especially in terms of because I've heard you tell the story before and it, it very much sounds like it was your idea. It was something that really grew out of you. But I, I suspect part of the reason it, I latched onto it so hard and so quickly was probably a similar thing in terms of myself, probably a sense of, well, I, I certainly am committed to Christ. Um, I'm a minister, uh, all of these things, but yet um, I have my own doubts. I know plenty of people who have, say, walked away from the faith. And at least at that point, the new atheist debate was really going strong. So walk me through a little bit about your thought process and setting that up. And then some of what you learned in those early days. Yeah, it, it, the, the, the beginning of the show did coincide kind of with when the new atheism was starting to come on stream. Um, that in a way that was a happy coincidence uh, I hadn't intended it to be that way but probably it was about yes only uh, 10 months after the show launched that Richard Dawkins book The God Delusion was published and and inevitably that that became a focus of a lot of the conversations fairly early on um, I mean the reasons for starting the show were, were honestly that I was this new sort of young radio journalist interested in maybe carving out my own space in the radio schedule and I was just interested in the idea of, of having conversations between Christians and non-Christians. Um, I think I had in, in my head some vague idea that this would lead to conversions on air, you know, and, and that didn't quite quite materialise. But it did it did create this interesting forum where people were willing to sit down and have these long form conversations. And what initially began, obviously, just on Christian radio as Christians listening, then turned into quite a lot of non-Christians, agnostics, atheists starting to tune in as they, like you, started to pick up the podcast when they heard their favourite atheist, you know, sharing it on their their media stream. So um, it, it kind of, yeah, it kind of grew into this slightly cult following people, both in the UK and across the pond who were listening. And, and as the new atheism sort of gained ahead of steam, I think it became more and more relevant in a way to people. So, uh, and, and I was just fortunate that um, a lot of interesting atheists, agnostics and Christians agreed to come on the show and have these discussions. So, yeah, it was it was it was marvelous to be to be, you know, ha helping and being part of that, really. I think the show could have gone poorly if it didn't have you as a host, because even though you developed an amazing Rolodex of very interesting people to bring on. I really do think the show worked because of you. Be now, what did you learn in terms of how you needed to approach people and how you needed to engage people in conversation in order to, I'm sure if you look back, you have some shows that you brought, got people in and you thought, oh boy, this is going to be great. 
and then it doesn't work at all. Then you brought out other people. Well, I got to fill the slot and maybe these will do. And then it goes. So what, yeah, what yeah. really, what really was it that would make the show really work when you felt it worked? Well, it was definitely something that I learned as I went along. And, and initially, of course, I knew very little about theology, apologetics, who was who in this world. So there was a lot of trial and error to start with. And yeah, there were definitely some kind of damp squibs of shows where someone who looked good on paper turned out to be not great, you know, in person, because it's one thing to write a, a cogent book or an article. Uh, you, you sometimes they discover that people aren't quite as good, you know, well, when, when they're put in front of a live mic. Um, I think it really helped as as other people started, you know, the, the world of the internet started to put stuff out online as well. And you you had more and more opportunity to listen and watch people through platforms like YouTube and other podcasts. And you got a sense of who, who were good communicators, who would be interesting guests to bring on. And as far as I was concerned, I, I was just trying to make sure that we had good representatives on both sides of whatever given topic we were deciding to to discuss and that as i say trial and error you know you 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 kind of learn who's who's who in this world who who seems to have the best arguments and the best manner and uh, and and that was it um initially you know in the early days of the radio show and the podcast the sort of who the personality was didn't seem to matter so much but i think it did kind of become increasingly if you like, just from a pure downloads sort of perspective, you know, the number of people who would end up listening, if you did manage to snare a big name, quote unquote, like a Richard Dawkins or someone, then inevitably that would, you know, make your podcast more visible to a lot more people as, as that got shared around. So um, I, I suppose I I did in the end kind of start to, uh, you know, reach out for and ask for some of these bigger names to come on the show, as well as having you know the randos if you like <laughs> that also populated the show and were great were great guests and you know uh debaters along the way so yeah that that was my approach it, it it was very much something i just picked up as i went along really what were some of the surprises that well, what were you surprised by especially in those early days sort of the heyday of new atheism uh, and talking to both sides putting people together um, I, you know, I remember hearing some shows could be fairly adversarial other shows. I, I, I remember the Richard Dawkins show. I don't know how many times you had him on, but I remember the one show where he had a, you had a Protestant and then you had a Jewish person and, um, you know, Richard Dawkins kept saying, well, I, I, you know, I wasn't really meaning people like you. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what were some of the surprises in that era of new atheism, um, that, yeah. Well, it was a surprise when Richard Dawkins said yes to, to doing that show. I'd, I'd somehow managed to get hold of his email address, and uh, this was that particular show that you're talking about. I think I think it, I think I didn't get get him on the show in that format until about 2013, and that was um, and that was in response to the fact that this sort of Bible TV series was airing, and because it was you know you know making the news a little bit. Um, I just reached out and thought, well, wouldn't it be fun if Richard Dawkins agreed to come on with a, a rabbi and uh, a Christian guest? And, and he did, you know, which was wonderful. And uh, so he he was kind of not speaking in his area of expertise, but then he, he has a habit of doing that. So that was fine. And he was he was great. It was great. You know, he, he had a, a good, interesting dialogue with them. And that so it was it was wonderful. I think in all honesty, what helped me just, you know, this random broadcaster in the UK to, to snare some of those more high profile guests was that it was a radio station so, and with some of those guests there's still a sort of uh, a prestige that that was associated with radio I think I think that's diminished as as podcasting and video channels have become you know huge things like the Joe Rogan podcast you know would smash the BBC in, in a ratings war I'm sure but it, it was there was still there was still at least at the time I was doing the show a sense that you know radio was this good format to be on and, and it was still a prestigious thing so I think I, I got probably more people than I deserved you know <laughs> to, to come on my little show and and participate um but yeah it, I was always surprised in a way that often when I did manage to get hold of people who I thought might be quite difficult to get hold of that you know if they if their email address was listed on a university website for instance you could usually get through to them and and you know more often than not they they said they'd be willing to try and make it work so so that was lovely to to, to kind of have the opportunity and um I, I suppose uh, who, who were some of the, the the most surprising ones in those early years um I mean I 
probably this kind, we didn't do so much of these in later years but but i do distinctly remember maybe you do paul some of the shows with muslims um and often quite feisty sort of um muslims uh who you know arguably were more on the fundamentalist end of the spectrum in terms of their beliefs and those were the kinds of muslims that would be turning up at um, speaker's corner in hyde park to debate on sundays with christians and it would get pretty boisterous and rowdy um and I even at one point went down and kind of recorded a mini show there of some of these debates that took place there because it was just fascinating and played that out on the Unbelievable Show. But I remember some of those podcasts between these these Muslims and Christian apologists got quite heated, even in the studio. And I would, you know, be having to really try to corral them into kind of behaving and uh, and so on. So so those those were some of the fun sort of memories of those those early years of the show. How do you think the show changed your faith? I would say that so many of the things that I ended up thinking through because of the show, I'd, I'd never even really had an opportunity to think about. You know, there were lots of things I, I'd never taken a perspective on because I almost didn't realise, you know, these were big issues of debate. I suppose I kind of had a vague sort of belief that, you know, the book of Genesis worked, you know, had to, complement science in some way and and so on but I've never really kind of taken the trouble to really work through it systematically and, and I suppose doing so many shows on issues like that you know creation evolution intelligent design and all the options in between helped me to sort of come to some kind of way of, of roughly thinking about it myself um likewise you know questions around um the historicity of the bible and the transmission of the text and those sorts of issues that we started to debate with people like Bart Ehrman and Peter J. Williams and others. I think I think all of that stuff kind of quickly helped me to start to put a more nuanced picture of the Bible um, from probably the one I'd received really, you know, growing up and as a young Christian. So, so all of that sort of helped to shape my faith. I think sometimes it, it was challenging as well, because when you first read a book by Bart Ehrman, you know, it is it, it can often be, be, be a wobbly moment. But for whatever reason, I was able to you know, I, I just found actually that the answers that were offered on the other side, once I started to look into it and bring these guests into dialogue, worked. And for me, you know, created a, a stronger faith in the long run. Um, so so there was there was all those sorts of issues that, that in a way, I suppose I was settling in my mind, even as I was presenting them on the show. I was doing a lot of that working out myself as we went along. I certainly didn't have all these issues settled before I began the show. As I say, some of them I was even not even aware of so so yeah lots lots of things change I mean one example I could give you a specific example of where I probably when I started I had one view and by the time I finished I had a different view on it would be the issue of hell um so probably I, I went in with you know a, a fairly typical evangelical eternal conscious torment view that it's a sort of place of eternal judgment um and I came out having done several shows over the years on issues you know, with perspectives from people with that perspective, annihilationism, and sometimes universalists as well. I, I found myself in the end most persuaded by the the um oh, sorry, I say universalist, the the annihilationist case, hmm. which is, you know, sort of the the view that actually there's a final end to um to those who ultimately reject Christ. And hmm. um I was persuaded, yeah, by by some of the guests I had on that that was a biblically orthodox view. And philosophically it for me, made more sense of the issues as well. So, uh, so there's one example where, yeah, I would say my faith was 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 actually changed, I I at least in terms of the the doctrinal aspects of it. Now we're gonna we're gonna talk about your second book because I really like this mm. book, and so we're gonna talk about that. But before we get to the second book, I want to talk about your first book because your first book um, touches on this that you you sort of sat between ostensibly warring parties on whole numbers of issues and in a day when you know this word deconstruction is sort of popular and there, there's sort of a sense in which the internet uh sort of knocks down um uh, flimsy trees all of what you did strengthened your faith you came out of this so tell me a little bit about the first book and and also sort of what prompted you to write that book yeah, I, I mean, arguably, I sort of went through all of the things that a deconstructing Christian might go through themselves. I, I certainly was forced to look at and reassess lots of my 
beliefs that I'd kind of grown up with and and taken as read. Uh, to, to, but so in a way, though, that the show was a good, really good place to do that process because you were doing it with people who were kind of questioning those beliefs and trying to pull them apart, but also with someone usually on the other side who was doing a pretty good job of of helping to you know see how you could make sense of these things and put them together. So um, my hope is that, and this is the testimony I've had from a lot of people who have you know undergone some deconstruction process that by and large the show helped them you know in sort of helping to make sense of their faith as they were starting to question things perhaps that they'd grown up with and everything else I mean we didn't tend to start using the word deconstruction until fairly right. recently I mean there was just a lot of people who, who said oh well I've been questioning my faith and the show helped a, a lot of the atheists I had on were ex-Christians as well so it's not as though that's a massively new phenomenon you know ex-evangelicals and so on um it, it it's just that we we tend to put a different label on it these days um and and in a way you know we were sort of asking the hardest questions we, we the fact that we really did did a show where we just invited people on to go on and ask really difficult questions of the Christian faith I think uh I think in some ways it, it was like well yeah we put ourselves in the firing line and if you could come out of that with a faith then great it, you know I think you're doing well and Christianity sort of has shown that it, it can survive that kind of questioning and so on um I, I think it's in my experience it's people who have such a rigid faith to start with that if you take out or have to adjust one segment of it or block the whole thing comes tumbling down I think that's and that's that's been a sort of salient lesson for me in the course of doing the shows is that lots of the the ex-Christians I met or people who, who just couldn't put the pieces back together it was because they've been given such a a rigid kind of structure to start with that it, it couldn't st stand being shaken a bit or having adjustments made um whereas I've always been a fan of I suppose that more mere Christianity approach where yes there are some important central core things that you need to be confident about and affirm but there's there's lots of other issues that actually I think we should be willing to be willing to, to see different perspectives on that I mean you know the the nature of the first chapters of Genesis for instance you know I think that's that's one where different Christians will take different approaches and that's okay um whereas for some people I think when that that block got questioned in their faith the whole thing seemed to come tumbling down and uh and that that for me is a sort of an unhealthy sort of starting point for you know so an unhealthy foundation in the sense that so easy to deconstruct if, if deconstruct just means demolish if if that's kind of the way it goes but but I, I was in the happy position of yeah um chairing these debates that for me at least helped to ultimately strengthen my faith and and then that led to what prompted you to want to write a book well the book was kind of at the 10 year mark of hosting these conversations and because at that point you know a lot of people were asking me personally well how how have you put the pieces together after hearing all of these objections from well-known atheists and so on I thought well maybe I, I am sort of ready at this point to write a book I'd, I'd been kind of starting to sort of give one or two talks on on how I started to, to make the case for faith from an apologetics point of view and I felt I had enough material enough sort of big thoughts and kind of interesting stories and ways of illustrating this to draw on to to make a book so so yeah it was about 10 years in that that I wrote um the first book unbelievable why after 10 years of talking with atheists I'm still a Christian and broadly speaking I, I'm I, I was I'm pretty happy with it even you know some six or seven years since I published that book um there's there's not a lot I would change because um I was as I said I was kind of defending that mere Christianity and I, th I think there was some sort of you know there there were some really helpful things I learned along the way that just helped to essentially one of the key lessons I spell out in the book is the realization fairly early on in hosting these conversations that everyone comes to life with a worldview and it's it's just as um important for an atheist uh, a person who believes you know that the universe is all there is um to justify their beliefs because there are all kinds of consequences that that naturalist materialist perspective entails and so that's what i really found helpful was that the show wasn't just about how you know christians having to defend their views against atheists it was also you know going on on the forefront and asking well how do you defend your atheist perspective can you can that make sense of the world as we see it and and i found that quite an exciting thing to kind of bring these two things you know up against each other and ask well which makes best sense of the world around us and i just found that a helpful way of 
sketching the issues out. And that's the way I basically wrote the book was basically contrasting the two ways of, of understanding reality. And my case was that Christianity made best sense of it. Now, in the last, oh boy, it's been a while now, already five, six years. Uh, the um, I, I, like the, I like the subtitle of your book, Why New Atheism Grew Old and Secular Thinkers Are Considering Christianity Again. What were some of you, what were as as someone who was sort of having to piece together programs, when did when did you first sense that new atheism was getting old and what were some of the tells? I think there were quite a few different things that, that seemed to be triggering me to the fact that this this movement was starting to lose steam. And um one of them, I suppose an early indication of that was that really not long after the movement began to be honest I, I was increasingly coming across atheists who were coming on the show but distinguishing themselves from Richard Dawkins and the new atheism saying uh, I'm not a Richard Dawkins kind of atheist and and that tells you something that that a certain number of people who don't claim a faith who are would think of themselves as atheists don't want to be associated with a particular style or brand of atheism and um and that's because I think it it was, you know, fairly soon coming to be seen as a rather dogmatic, shrill, fundamentalist in its own way, sort of way of, of putting things across. And so some people wanted to disassociate themselves from it. So I thought that was an interesting thing to start with. Um, and then you had the fact that um, I was increasingly seeing uh, sort of latterly the conversation start to change on the show. I, I think to, to a large degree, you know, without me kind of really intending it, the shows tended to track what was going on in the culture. And so if most of the kind of conversations happening in the world of social media and the public sphere were kind of in that sort of new atheist camp, then that tended to be the kind of conversations that would be reflected on the show. And the fact that I started to have less of those and started to feature more of these kind of more nuanced conversations between um, Christian thinkers, and secular thinkers, but secular thinkers who weren't dismissing Christianity out of hand. Um, probably, you know, a really key moment was 2018 when I had Jordan Peterson on the show, who, of course, uh, you had on your show before he got really famous. Well, I, I managed to get him on my show before he went really stratospherically famous um, because he was he just sort of published or was in the process of publishing 12 Rules for Life. He'd kind of grown this cult audience through his uh, lectures and so on and, and his YouTube channel. But it was sort of a couple of days after he recorded this show where he debated, can we make sense of life without God with Susan Blackmore, with me. A couple of days after we recorded that, he went and had that interview with Kathy Newman while he was in the UK that just went everywhere, went viral, you know, debating the gender pay gap and so on. And suddenly everyone was talking about this Canadian psychologist and people were writing op-eds and all sorts. And so I, I was sitting on this sort of uh, this great material, but I wasn't about to I wasn't going to air it for a, a few months because it was part of this special new series we were developing called The Big Conversation. And we all had to say that I think Jordan Peterson himself was a significant sort of marker that, that something had changed because he was ostensibly a secular intellectual, but who was just speaking very differently about Christianity to the new atheists. And I just instinctively felt like, you know, when when he came to London that first time, I remember the publicist telling me, oh, she she hadn't quite realised how how big a deal he was obviously going to be. And uh, she said, well, we booked this sort of thousand seater auditorium and it sold out within minutes. And so we booked another one, you know, booked a second night and it sold out again. And um, and she's and she said, and it's all these these young people who are coming along to 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 hear this, this chap you know and um and that was just a taste of the, of the fact that obviously he he was he, he'd grown this audience you know and um and that audience only, obviously only increased um in in the, the following year or so and why was he suddenly attracting all the same kind of demographic who were turning up for the new atheists before that was that was what intrigued me so that and and other similar thinkers of a similar nature who were not playing by the new atheist playbook when it came to questions around God and Christianity and culture made me realize something's changed in the culture there's there seems to be a new openness at least at that level to to talking about faith um and uh yeah so those were some of the sort of the the bellwethers if you like that that the thing was changing and then there were there were other things that came in and 
all together kind of made me think actually yeah there's a there's something going on here that's worth worth writing about and yeah telling people about did you ever do a show where you had two atheists and you had sort of uh new atheism versus atheism plus you did a nice job in the book sort of running through that history i i really wasn't aware of that um early on when james Lindsay was getting some traction you know i had seen that he and and peter bogosian had sort of been you know new atheists doing that thing but then of course they were making different noises so i i had a conversation with james Lindsay, and he was the one who sort of laid out for me this schism the schism in the the church of atheism um mm. did you did you run into some of that I, as you yeah were going? i i was I was definitely watching from the sidelines as a lot of that was playing out. Um, I was because I was interested in what was going on in the atheist world and was quite engaged, you know, on Facebook groups and things like that. I tended to to see when, yeah, things like Elevator Gate, for, for instance, happened. This was this this famous moment where the uh, just to play, paint it very briefly, um, a, a female skeptical blogger uh, called Rebecca Watson was propositioned in an elevator at a atheist conference in Dublin, wrote about it on a blog, well, filmed a, blog, a vlog about it. Uh, and Richard Dawkins then came in, sort of, you know, poured gasoline on top of this uh, already heated thing. Um, and it all exploded because there were those who were supporting her and saying, yes, we have a problem with misogyny and patriarchy in the atheist movement. And people like Dawkins saying, oh, you know, just use common sense, This is this is not such a big deal. And and that was, I think, one of the moments when we started to see this this rift develop between atheism plus the form of atheism that wanted to be um, atheism with commitments to, you know, um, feminism, LGBT race and so on. And others who felt this was all politically correct ideology stealing in on their, you know, oasis of free thinking and so on. Um, so so that was kind of where I was. I was kind of watching with interest. I, I think at that point you obviously only see these things in hindsight very often, but what, what I think happened to New Atheism is basically the culture wars ate New Atheism. And what what was coming down the line, of course, was all these debates that we're now constantly surrounded by around LGBT and trans and, and everything else with the, the woke and the anti-woke kind of sides constantly battling each other. And what you saw, I think, was a kind of early stage of that in the New Atheism where suddenly that movement itself split into its kind of woke and anti-woke um you know parts and, uh, and and a lot of people have said that in a way new atheism itself was was like primed with people in both camps interestingly they were kind of happy to work together for a while on the whole you know god doesn't exist and religion's bad for you thing but i didn't think they'd realized until they actually got down to the point of discussing well what happens next that actually they held very different views on what happened you know how you actually go about building a, a society and and this was in you mentioned Peter Bogosian. I think again, a sort of mini conversation I had with him kind of alerted me to the fact something was changing quite dramatically in the culture. When um, you may remember back in I think it was something like 2014 or 2013, he had published this basically new atheist book, a manual for creating atheists. He was very much a card carrying new atheist as a Portland philosophy professor. Uh, and this and and he was sort of talking about the fact that religion is just this mental delusion and that kind of thing. I brought him on the show, had a had a good interchange with a Christian thinker called Tim McGrew and um, and didn't think much more of it. it. It was a good popular show. But then about four or five years later, I contacted him because we were coming out to the, the West Coast to do uh, an event in Portland. And I was looking for an atheist to be on stage and, and in, engage with a Christian thinker. And I reached out to him, obviously, and and his email response made me realise just obviously that things had changed for him immensely because he said you'd hardly recognise, you know, where I stand on these issues now, Justin, because I, I I don't think of Christians as my enemy anymore. I think more of them as allies, actually, because there's there's a much more pernicious evil that I'm now dedicating myself to fighting. So I, I'm going to respectfully decline your invitation. Um and this was just so different to, to sort of the, his tone before <laughs> towards Christians. And of course, what it transpired was that along with James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose, his co-conspirators, they were developing this whole, you know, academic ruse to submit hoax uh, papers to peer reviewed journals using all of the politically correct terminology of grievance studies in order to kind of show why this was just a bit of a farcical thing and that 
and kind of, you know, um, talk about all their concerns with the council culture and threats to academic freedom that these particular ideologies were bringing by having to be included within every single discipline. And, and so that that obviously was a whole kind of controversy in itself. But just receiving that email and seeing the way that Peter Bogosian's concerns had swung right right round from critiquing you know established religion to effectively critiquing a new form of religion um and that was the sort of the woke ideologies that he's now spends most of his time you know debating and engaging so it was just interesting because it, it, it just it was around that time again it, so that would have been 2019 that that happened uh, no 2018 sorry 2018 uh a lot seemed to be changing in that sort of year and around that time where the new atheism felt like it had sort of just gone away suddenly and been replaced by all these people kind of really concerned about the direction of culture and realizing Christianity was probably, it was a case of probably better the devil you knew, you know, the, rather than this, this new uh, woke ideology that was right on their doorstep, that was literally in academia. It wasn't the fundamentalist church down the road anymore. It was your, the person, you know, in the, the office next door to you. So, so that I think was, was, was a big change for, in, in many ways. What was it about Jordan Peterson that first caught your interest? And, um, you know, I, I remember when you were sort of rolling out this big conversation that was you know, a little bit higher profile, a little bit better um, production values, um, video. Again, there was sort of a turn towards video. What, what was it about Jordan that sort of caught your eye and, and made you want to have him on your show? Well, in all honesty, I, I think I'd vaguely heard of him. Uh, in 2017, because there'd been one or two articles about this maverick psychologist sort of making a stand against forced language and so on in Canada with pronouns and so on. Um, but I hadn't really, it hadn't registered very strongly with me. And then um, I, uh, I have a friend called Perry Marshall, um, who's been on the show before. He's sort of got a sort of special interest in evolution and Christianity and things. And I, I would occasionally meet up with him when he was in London and I I think this is probably around September October 2017. I said Perry, I'm we're 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 getting ready to film this new series next year. The big conversation. I think of you as someone with your you know your ear to the ground. Who 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 should I be inviting? And he said, Well, have you heard of this guy Jordan Peterson? He he sounds pretty interesting. He's he's getting quite followers. So, oh, I'll check him out. You know. And then I looked him up and I thought, Oh, it's that that guy. I'd heard one or two other people mentioning him. Um, but even at that stage, when I sort of then sent an email, basically, I. I uh, I think via the, the publicist of, of the book because I hadn't yet been published. I didn't. I didn't really sort of. It didn't. I didn't think. Whoa, this guy's going to be a big deal at that point. I think it. It gradually became clearer and clearer though as the day drew nearer that I was hearing more and more about him. So fortunately, we'd, we'd kind of managed to secure a spot with him fairly early on. And um, I mean, at that point, that was the point where I, I think you could still reach him by his website, you know, um, via an email address. So. Uh, but as I say, I think it it only dawned on me. It was only really once that Kathy Newman interview came out that it dawned on me. Oh, right, we've we've got something really hot here. There's this guy's obviously gonna gonna be a big deal, um, and that was yeah, and, and that was that really. So so uh, up to that point, I thought he was an interesting guy. He's got some interesting ideas. Um, let's see where this goes. I, I was kind of a bit confused by him because he was. You know, when he came on the show, he was like he could have been the Christian apologist, you know, but then he wasn't quite willing to say he was a Christian either. So um, so that was one interest. It was an interesting show in itself, because normally, as you know, my format would have been Christian versus non-Christian. But that wasn't really that format. That was two non-Christians, one of them kind of acting very like a Christian. So <laughs> it was uh, it, it was a bit different. And that was fine. It, you know, it went really well and was very interesting. And. And and then obviously I think I formed more opinions about him as the world started talking about him in that way. What what do you think? What do you think it was about Jordan that sort of turned him into this catalyst? That you know, one of the things that I noticed right away when I was reading comment sections on YouTube and watching the biblical lectures closely, you know, for me it was that people who I had seen for years go down the one way streets of either sort of atheism or new age spirituality, people start then coming back and saying, 
oh, there's something about the Bible. And, you know, maybe I want to go to church, but I don't know really what kind of church would work. What, what do you think it was about Jordan that, because he certainly wasn't anything like William Lane Craig or any of these yeah. other sort of standard apologists. He had an effectiveness, which was very different, especially even in terms yeah. of how people responded to him. I think there's a few things. I think I think one of them is that he wasn't, in a sense, a kind of paid up Christian. And so people couldn't put him in that box. And um, and he wasn't so he wasn't in that sense simply preaching a Christian gospel, um, which which in a sense would immediately, I think, mean people could label him as, oh, he's just another Christian apologist sort of thing. Um it was because he was sort of straddling these various worlds. You know, he, he he did, you know, have sort of academic credentials and he did have, you know, a sort of uh, psychological take on things. And and so people kind of felt like it wasn't that threatening because it, it felt like he was he wasn't telling me, you know, that there's there's heaven and hell and sin and judgment. And, you know, my life is on the line here. It felt more like he was kind of offering some kind of a psychological approach to thinking about life and and, and so on. Um, but at the same time, I think I think it, the other the other thing that Jordan Peterson was was it, it was like um, you really felt like you were watching someone who was working out their own faith in public, and that that was quite endearing in its way. I think a lot of people felt like, well, I'm kind of in the same boat as this person. You know, this this I'm, I don't feel like I'm being preached at by this person. This this is someone who's kind of going on a journey themselves. And then there was just the fact he was so disarmingly honest and open especially in his public presentations you know to the point of tearing up on stage frequently or in interviews and and I think that kind of it, it, it was there was a kind of a bearing of his own soul that people found like very refreshing I think to some extent the new atheists and many sort of secular intellectuals they 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 can kind of put on a you know a good argument but it's still quite abstract and you feel like you've just sort of you know, you, you they're holding your arm's length. With Jordan, it was like a, a bit of a bear hug to the people who started following him because it was like, he understands my pain. He <laughs> understands my frustration. He he gets me, you know, he's kind of like, he's on he's on the same team as me. And I, I just think, for whatever reason, I think that kind of paternalistic father figure that he obviously represented to a lot of younger men, they just felt like he really cared about them. And and so I think that drew them into the, especially to to kind of the, the message he had and made it feel vibrant and alive and like, yeah, maybe, maybe there is something more, maybe, you know, and um, yeah, I, I I just think that it, it was just a breath of fresh air as well. I, I think in all honesty, sometimes it's only when you sort of, I don't know, open the door and, you know, let some fresh air in that you realise what you've been missing. And I think a lot of people had kind of been swimming in a a very sort of, uh, logical materialist kind of abstract world of the, of the new atheists, you know, where it all had to be evidence and strict facts and science. And Jordan Peterson didn't dismiss that side of things. You know, he, he took a kind of scientific logical approach to things, but he kind of also said, but there's more to it, isn't there? There's a sort of, you know, there's something more, there's something. And, and I think people just resonated with that, that actually, yeah, I, I think there is, you know, I, it, it was almost like he gave them permission to kind of, park the kind of super rational you know um ultra logical part of their brain and just think what if the world is a bit enchanted and magical and something else is going on he never he, he, he at least to begin with he didn't often you know give that the label god but i think increasingly he has actually yeah. um in in recent years and and to that extent i think yeah he was in that sense opening the door for people to that he was he was sort of quickly 2018. I don't know when Tom Holland's Dominion came out, but I remember when I first um, saw Tom Holland and started reading Dominion, I thought, e even though Tom is approaching this at a very different way from Jordan Peterson, I think temperamentally, he's also a very different person than Jordan Peterson. I sort of immediately saw some congruity between what Tom Holland was working on and sort of what Jordan Peterson broke open. So, so when, when did Tom sort of get on your radar? 
So Tom got on my radar a bit earlier than Jordan Peterson because I first noticed him probably when he wrote that article, I think it was for The Observer, um, called um, Why I Changed My Mind or something like that. And they were inviting various different thinkers to, to write articles on them changing. And he he chose Christianity, Why I Changed My Mind About Christianity. And this essentially this was dominion in sort of article form. And... Uh, and he and I just found this fascinating. I read this. It was sort of being circulated in, you know, in my kind of social media circles a bit. And I thought, oh, this is an interesting guy, secular guy, but who acknowledges the the value of Christianity and the way it shaped us and says at the end of this article, in almost every way, I am a Christian. Um, and then Larry Hurtado brought out his book, Destroyer of the Gods. Um, I don't know if you remember that, but um, and I, I sort of um, had a preview copy and was just flicking through. It. I thought, well, oh, this isn't dissimilar to what you know Tom Holland was saying in that article because uh, Larry Hattari's point basically was this was about early Christianity and and the way it kind of upended kind of the you know ideas about God in that day and age and the this idea of a God who's sacrificed on behalf of people was you know very revolutionary. Well, obviously this is the same sort of thing that that Tom Holland was saying, and uh, so I. So I had, so I just thought, well, maybe I could bring these two together. And uh, so I reached out to them both. Can't remember exactly how. And they both said yes. And Tom Holland, in fact, was delighted because he'd been wanting to engage with Larry Hurtado, who he had heard of. And Larry seemed very pleased to, to be on the end of a line from Scotland where he was to engage with Tom. So that was my first engagement. And I just remember it being a really lovely, warm kind of, you know, podcast that we recorded bet between them. Um, we kind of got round as we often have ever since in conversation with Tom Holland to the kind of question of his own personal sort of journey. And, and he talked about the fact that, you know, well, you know, uh, there's the dinosaurs, that's a bit of a problem, but I, I, in my, you know, it, 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 there are some moments where it, I just feel like maybe, maybe it could be true and that kind of thing. And, uh, and, I, I, and so, I have to, I'm going yeah. to have to <laughs> tease, you know, Tom Holland, <laughs> The rest is history. He's always doing these horrible impersonations. I'm going to have to tease your impersonation of Tom Holland because I thought it was very good. Oh, thank you, thank you. Well, um, I, I mean, anyway, we we got on well personally, and um, we sort of kept in touch a bit. And then, and then, N.T. Wright the following year in 2018 brought out his book, um, big book on Paul. Well, no, his this is little book on Paul. Uh, this was his kind of. Uh, yeah, uh, accessible version of the biography of Paul. And again, um, and Tom got in touch with me to say, could I get an introduction to the great man, um, Tom Holland, that is, to, to N.T. Wright. I said, of course, and you probably don't need me to make an introduction. Um, and so, uh, in, uh, and, and I'd seen that Tom had actually endorsed uh, N.T. Wright's book. And so I thought, well, this could be fun to get these two guys together again. And we did, and that, that was fantastic. Had, they had a great conversation. By this time, we were filming the shows and it did very well on YouTube as well. And uh, and Tom very kindly at that time, sort of um, Tom Holland, that is, sent me some draft chapters of this book Dominion that he'd been working on. And so I got to, to read some of these and I thought they were tremendous and really didn't have much to offer in terms of feedback. It was they were already you know far better than anything I could I could write myself. But I could see that um, this book was going to be special. And um, and so it emerged, you know, when it was published, you know, the following year. Uh, and and again, I had one of the most memorable shows ever when when I brought him on with AC Grayling to debate that book. Yeah. AC Grayling being a, a you know well known sort of new atheist style philosopher here in the UK, and and they had quite the different conversation to that Larry Hurtado and N.T. Wright conversations. That one was a real kind of sparky whiz bang of a show um, as they debated you know whether basically Christianity was good for us or not. Um, historically speaking. So so it's been great fun um, to see him to be sort of a little bit involved in his journey and his evolution. And, and uh, he's been remarkably kind with his time and friendship, you know, to to give me lots of opportunities to to tease him about his uh, his journey along the way. Um, in fact, we, we're trying to get together to um, to do a bit of a book launch for my book um, in London in October. So um, we're, we're, I'm hoping we can make a date work for for. Tom to be part of that, which, which would be great fun to have him, you know, in, in discussion for, for that event. Yeah. And and then yet another character comes on the scene, someone who is quite different, uh, who who appeared with Jordan on stage in that in that series with Sam Harris, um, uh, Douglas Murray. Mm. Uh, 
and he's another and so you know i guess you know part of what we're seeing is you know there's jordan peterson there's tom holland there's douglas murray and now we're seeing you know mary harrington louise perry we're sort of seeing this this wave emerge and you know douglas murray a a gay man who is a you know a a, a very witty um sharp-tongued conservative which i mean nobody sort of skewers people like murray does um and th there seemed to be just this whole group and a lot of them in the uk which is which is very interesting this whole class which is sort of coming to the fore and they're you know it's it's not just one or the other it's this whole group so what what do you think is behind this wave besides let's say the holy spirit um what what what's going on especially in the uk mm, mm. it's interesting that that yeah you, you label it as a uk phenomenon i, I mean obviously the jordan, jordan peterson is is the exception to that but but i, I understand what you're saying for a relatively small island and population we, we do seem to be producing a number of these interesting secular thinkers reconsidering the christian worldview and socking it to the new atheists and so on um i i don't know it might, maybe there's there's something about there there being a little bit more of a sort of countercultural kind of spirit uh, among some brits um i i mean it's interesting that I, I think with the transgender thing for instance um britain has kind of veered away a bit more than other western countries like canada and the usa from policies around you know young people and so on um receiving that kind of gender affirming care as it's called because and i and partly i've wondered if that's because there is i don't know maybe a bit more of a conservative underlying kind of sentiment still that bubbles away in the uk and um and i i i, I sense that 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 still exists you know with with some of those characters like douglas murray and others they're kind of tapping into something that's that's quite you know, been around a long time in UK circles. Uh, I think it's also, there's, there is a difference um, in terms of the religiosity that's on offer in the UK and the USA. So the new atheism was kind of really driven by US politics and a se sense that, you know, because there was a large Christian right in the, the USA, that was kind of the thing that, that it was really set against. Christianity in the UK has, for a long time been regarded as a kind of you know uh, uh, a benign sort of grandfatherly presence really uh it's a sort of the state religion the Ang anglicanism you know it's associated with um harvest festivals and you know uh, sort of village events and things it's it's not seen as this you know it's not generally seen as uh, this terribly oppressive force or anything like that um it was easier to paint that picture i think in the, the usa and so i think i think there wasn't the antipathy to religion in quite the same way in the UK as there was the US. And that's why I think you can have people like Douglas Murray, who kind of became atheists, but they didn't really become very anti-religious. They they kind of still had a kind of a, a, a sort of wistful sort of, uh, you know, fondness for the the structures of the church, you know, for, 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 for its uh, aesthetic and its um, its age and, you know, the buildings and what it off the way uh, you know speaks to British culture I, I mean even Richard Dawkins you know doesn't want to go knocking down every parish church and cathedral he he, he loves I think he he acknowledges that there's a kind of cultural value to Christianity in that sense um so I think all of that together combined to to maybe make the the, the kind of situation so that once it became possible to kind of not the new atheism did kind of fade out of view a bit a lot of people found that they they kind of realized well the direction culture is going actually maybe it's okay to say christianity got some things right and um it's okay to start you know i i think a lot of people got emboldened as well just by because of social media and the internet seeing other similar figures starting to talk in similar ways to them and and they they realized actually it's okay for me to hold these views and to be who i am and yeah, I've I've been very encouraged in a way by some of those figures coming to the fore. Um, I think it is a sign that things are changing. That that actually um, there's a sort of new openness to uh, Christianity. Um, not that these people are all 
becoming Christians, but they're kind of making it uh, an intellectual option for people to explore it, I think. Um, and and it's fascinating when you do get the chance to talk with some of them on a personal level. A lot of them seem to sort of wish it were true, you know, even if they haven't gone the whole hog themselves. There's sort of there's a wistful desire that this could really be the store of reality. And uh, and I yeah, I, I, I've, I've been fascinated to see that as, as some of those characters have, have come up. I'm curious as to really what the shape of this will be with respect to the church. You know, when my first trip to Europe last summer, it was very interesting for me looking at sort of, I spoke with a number of Church of England clergy. They said very surprising things to me in terms of, I thought, wow, this is a, it's a very different context than the United States. And one of the things that I've noticed is that on, on one hand, there is a real hunger for a deeply enchanted, rigorous, strange faith and practice. You see, I see that in many ways with someone like Paul Kingsnorth who, you know, he didn't just, you know, slide back into the pew of the Church of England someplace. He, you know, went to Romanian orthodoxy in a, you know, in a monastery that found its way to, to Ireland. And, you know, I see often, you know, when I listen to Tom Holland, there's a tension on one hand, you know, I, you know, Tom Holland, for all his love for dinosaurs, also loves, um, you know, loves the the classical world and medieval strangeness. I mean, I'll, I'll often go there with his podcast, and 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 for him, sometimes, you know, perhaps following in the in the legacy of Tolkien and Lewis, you know, very much wanting to inhabit a deeply enchanted world. Mm. Yet, there's also the tension that, you know, we still sort of need to keep our day jobs, and we still sort of need to keep up appearances. And to, um, you know, go full Paul King's North, let's say, of, well, I'm going to go and do biodynamic farming in a little place in Ireland. Uh, that's not necessarily available to to someone who necessarily lives in London. And so mm. what what are some of your thoughts on, on on maybe how this this new embrace of the faith and not just the faith intellectually but i mean because right now faith in terms of practice is is very is very important the you know latin mass in the catholic church is very hot orthodoxy mm. is mm. has a deep attraction to some people how's that going to play out mm. what are your thoughts I, on I, at least initially I, I i i'm fascinated by this as well paul because so many of the speak the thinkers as i say we interact with a lot of similar people have said broadly similar things that they don't want the church just to be another mouthpiece of the culture they don't want sort of warmed over secular humanism with with god added on top in church they want something weird they want something different they want sort of full-blooded christianity um and and yeah they want that kind of a lot of them want that more ancient liturgical sort of stream of the church because it feels different it feels you know otherworldly and um, that's exactly what Tom Holland is attracted to. I think if if he were to kind of embrace faith, you know, Douglas Murray would, I'm sure, probably go in that direction. Um, that might be a personality thing. It's just, you know, these are people who, who don't want anything that feels faddish or modern, you know, in that sense. You know, when it comes to something like that, it just feels more appropriate for whatever reason. And um, and, and so I can understand that. And. But a lot of them, you know, the, the phrase that's, that has cropped up a few times is, you know, keep Christianity weird. It's that that sense that they just want, they don't want it to be dumbed down, diluted, just turned into another sort of, you know, National Health Service campaign, as I think Tom Holland often felt during the pandemic. That Word that for the day. The American church was doing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thought for the day type Christianity. Um and then you've got, you know, it, I didn't, have you had Ben Six Smith on your show? No, um, I know who he is. But though. again, yeah, similar kind of guy, young, sort of agnostic, but again, very attracted to, I think, Roman Catholicism. And in his case, he kind of, he's he's really gone on a journey seeing some of the arguments for that. And I, uh, I've interviewed him for a new podcast documentary series based on the book that, that I'm currently putting together. 
and um, and he wrote this article that got shared quite widely in my circles where where he said this in the spectator he said i'm not religious so it's not my place to dictate to christians what they should and should not believe still if someone has a faith worth following i feel that their beliefs should make me feel uncomfortable for not doing so if they share 90 percent of my lifestyle and values then there's nothing especially inspiring about them instead of making me want to become more like them it looks very much as if they want to become more like me and and i think there's something in that you know that this idea that I, I think one of the problems that the church has had is, is by desperately trying to be relevant, they become increasingly irrelevant because half the time the church just doesn't do popular culture as well as popular culture does it. And um, and in a way, and whether it's sort of, I mean, in that instance, he was specifically kind of talking about celebrity churches that kind of ape, you know, pop culture and so on. But equally, whether it be kind of on an ethical front, you know, churches that just sort of essentially follow the same tram lines as as culture in terms of sexual ethics and everything else or it be um you know just 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 a sort of trying to fit in uh, i i think there is a danger that the church can actually lose people when it thinks it you know and and i think that has to be obviously taken into consideration in every circumstance because it's not that everyone wants to turn up to a latin mass or anything like that there's going to be some people that that's that's definitely going to be their bag but but it's it's how do you make church distinctive enough for there to be something worth turning up for basically i think so it's not just something that i could get somewhere else i could get this if i'm just looking for a community i could get that at a golf club um it's it's kind of i think that's the challenge for the church to 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 how if if we're all about helping to tell a different story in our culture because the stories people are running on are kind of running out of steam and not satisfying them how do we tell that story so it's as, as compelling and engaging and interesting uh, as possible and I, I think some of those thinkers you know can help us with that it's a, it certainly point out sometimes when the church doesn't do that well um, as Tom Holland said in a, a recent edition of one of my newer podcasts re-enchanting he said you know when when church what turns him off church is when it just becomes this yeah pallid sort of reflection of culture and he he wants the yeah he wants the real thing and uh, and i think we should be little delivering it so yeah that's the challenge well we'll talk about your your new podcast and and the book and then also this other podcast that's connected to the book that you're working on yeah so um Shortly after moving on from The Unbelievable Show, which was a very bittersweet goodbye after 17 and a half years of, of hosting the show, um, I, 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 I have been able to start some new projects. Um, one of them is this re-enchanting uh, podcast. Uh, we're soon going to be launching a second season in October. But essentially, it's um, it's filmed at Lambeth Palace Library. It's a wonderful venue where it, Lambeth Palace, for those who don't know, is sort of the seat of the Archbishop of Canterbury in London. And... Um, the organisation behind the Reenchanting podcast is a sort of an Anglican sort of initiative, um, but it's a kind of um, it, it's really about uh, speaking to a secular world and asking, can we reenchant a secular material world with the sort of Christian vision of reality? And to that extent, we we try to speak to people both with and without faith, but who perhaps like the Tom Hollands of this world and Louise Perry's are kind of quite open to to, to what Christianity may have to offer. So we've had both of them on the first season, Paul Kingsnorth as well, who's already been mentioned and others who who kind of fit into that mould of, of sort of asking whether this world is enough, if this culture is enough and, and in their own spheres of influence, the way they've seen the Christian story somehow resonate with them and 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 so on. So we, we continue to do that with some interesting guests in season two. Um, uh, I don't know if you come across him there because he's more of a, a well known in the in the UK, I imagine, but a, a comedian called Frank Skinner will be our first person on season two. He's a he's a very well known comedian here in the UK. Um, he's had a long running kind of comedy partnership with a an atheist um, called David Badil, who's um, quite well known sort of secular Jewish atheist. Um, Frank Skinner has been his long time comedy partner, but Frank Skinner is a very kind of committed Catholic, hmm. and he's just a very interesting, fascinating guy, very funny. Um, sort of a bit of a contradiction as well because he's lived this very um a life full of venal sins he would tell you um and yet turned up for you know for mass every sunday as well so um so he's an interesting character and there's there's lots of others that that, that we'll be introducing in in 
the, this new season. So that's that's been fun getting on board with some new projects like that. The book, of course, launching as um, means that there's been lots of um, interviews like this to, to to be organizing. But one of the the yeah one of the big things in the pipeline at the moment is a sort of documentary podcast series, really opening up some of the themes in this book, looking at the firstly the rise and fall of new atheism, then looking at some of these new secular thinkers who are starting to ask these questions, and and then kind of going through history, culture philosophy, the Bible, science, to, to look at all the different spheres where I've seen people pushing back against a materialist sort of, you know, account of reality and starting to, to return even secular thinkers to sort of very Christian friendly or adjacent conclusions and and really asking in the end whether perhaps we, we are seeing a turning of the tide, you know, to quote Matthew Arnold's, you know, poem about the sea of faith going out, or maybe it's time for that see a faith to start coming back in and this might be the moment so so that's the the the, the book and the, the the podcast documentary series will kind of flesh that out in in long form so if if anyone enjoyed things like the rise and fall of mars hill podcast or the witch trials of jk rowling those it'll be that kind of documentary podcast style that you can expect and looking forward to seeing what people make of it because this is very much a return for me to to my roots i started in radio documentary making more than live live radio uh, so this has been fun to go back to something a bit more polished and, and you know, telling a narrative um, and uh, and a lot more work, actually, <laughs> quickly <laughs> discovering. But but it's it's fun work. It's good. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what what people make of it. How, how many episodes do you anticipate the podcast being yet? Do you know? It'll be 21 episodes Okay, because um, so we're, we're we're, we're going to put three three episodes per chapter of the book basically so that, okay. that's seven chapters three three episodes per chapter and and an introductory episode so 22 my hope is that if if it seems to be going well if people are enjoying it that it's not necessarily something that has to have a kind of firm end there will be a narrative that that you know is is cast across those episodes but in a way i think i see this as an evolving movement this surprising rebirth of belief in god that even you know as always when you write a book as soon as you've handed it over to the publisher you come across all kinds of new interesting people you wish you'd included in it um so there's you know i only give louise perry a very brief mention in the book um but you know she's a fascinating character who's come on the scene in the last year really and um martin shaw you may have come across martin shaw recently paul uh, again a very paul king's north type story of a, a mythologist and storyteller suddenly having his eyes opened and becoming like Paul uh, uh, Eastern Orthodox and, and various others that I keep bumping into. So I feel like probably if, you know, if it feels right, we might just continue adding um, episodes as we go, as, as seems appropriate to continue telling stories of the surprising rebirth of belief in God. But, but yeah, what the meat of it will be this, this documentary podcast. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Any anything we didn't cover in the book or that you'd like to mention or ask or leave it open ended for you? Well, I mean, there's one, one of the big, I suppose, themes of the book is is this idea that and you've covered this probably ad infinitum on your podcast, Paul. But but I do think that the meaning crisis is, is a significant factor in all of this. And, and I, I talk about that in some detail in the book. I think one of the things that, the, you know, the people like Jordan Peterson and, and other psychologists like John Verveke and Jonathan Haidt and others, the secular psychologists are kind of keying into is this idea of the meaning crisis in Western culture. And the, and the, the new atheism simply failed to address it. In fact, to some extent it exacerbated it, I think, because it basically reinforced this idea that we live in a essentially a meaningless, purposeless, deterministic universe. And and that just does lend itself to a kind of nihilistic story of reality. And when you couple that with the rise of all these, you know, progressive ideologies that are about essentially inventing yourself from scratch and technology that forces you to see how everybody else is doing that and constantly burdens you with inventing your, your own soul from scratch, I think all of this has kind of come together to, to create this this so-called meaning crisis, and the, the the challenge for me is that I sometimes wonder whether the church even realizes that's what's happening. I, I sometimes feel like the church is sort of still engaging with 
other issues or the new atheism as though that's still the, the, the thing that needs to be dealt with. And, and actually there's there's a whole this, there's this whole thing that the psychologists have worked out is happening. And basic for me, the, my simple diagnosis of it is that we need a story to live by. We're kind of meaning making story driven creatures. Now, my atheist friends will tell me, you know, that's that's just a kind of psychological crutch or whatever. But actually, I think I think it's woven into us because there is a, a God who created us to be part of a story. And the best story that I think has ever been told is the Christian story. But we've lost that in the West and it's been replaced by all these you know, stories that are not doing the job. Um, the God shaped hole that, uh, you know, Blaise Pascal identified still exists. And we're trying to fill it with the quasi religious kind of um, movements and, and, and concerns. And uh, and I just feel like if we could get our act together, this could be the most amazing moment for the church to to remind people and, and present them with the story that makes sense of all of those stories. So that's kind of one of my big picture sort of aims with the book is to say, can we tell this this true and beautiful story better? And um, could we take a leaf out of the book of some of these secular intellectuals who are often doing a better job as prophets outside the church, t- telling us what yeah. the problem, diagnosing the problem at least, not always having all the answers, but but they they I think we should be hearing, list, understanding, listening to them, and and asking, well, well, maybe we have something that can offer. So so um yeah, so that's that's my hope is that that in some way it will inspire people to to think about what that could look like in the future. I I don't have any grand visions of what the church will be and how that will work out I just know that that there's an opportunity here and and I just sense that as that tide turns will we be ready to sort of receive the people who who I think are going to come back and amen to that so thank you Justin and again uh when is the book coming out in the U.S. the U.K. well at the time of recording it's literally just been released uh, published uh, in the U- U.S. So okay. it, if you order it now, you will get a copy in your hands, you know, quite quickly. Um, right. If if people want to get hold of it, um, you can do that via my website. Um, there is links there in all the usual ways. But you could also get a signed copy via my website. So if you would like one signed signed by my own fair hand, you can, wow. you can go there to do that. You, you, you didn't I have know. your kids in a room doing all this for you, <laughs> did you? That's right. <laughs> Slave labor. They're packaging the books and posting them out. Um, no, no, it's so well. You know, I'm freelance now. I've got to, I've got to make ends meet somehow, Paul. That's you right. Know. You tell um, those kids, you, you kids want to eat. Absolutely. Here's yeah, a box. Exactly. Get to work. <laughs> Rather Dickens esque so, um, story. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but people are welcome to go to the website, um, order the book. I'd be delighted if you did that. Obviously, justinbriley.com. Um, and if you sign up to the newsletter there, you'll be kept abreast as well of new projects like the Reenchanting podcast and this new podcast documentary series on the surprising rebirth of belief in God. So, yeah, that's that's the place to go. All right. Well, send send me this will be out in a few days. So send me the link. Uh, you have your person email me all the links you want included. And I'll put them down below in the notes and they'll be on the audio podcast, too. So, Justin, thank you so much for your time. Always great to see you. It's been a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you, Paul. Great, great to chat with you.